It's lovely to see you all here. I wish we were in like a big room, you know, having some coffee or wine or having a big conversation in person, but we're doing the second best. Hey, so I think we've got a number of folks here. Welcome. I'm sure we'll have more folks joining. Um, I'll just um, introduce myself. My name is Erica Ginsberg. I'm part of the documentality team. I am a white woman uh, with curly brown, almost shoulder length hair. I'm wearing a yellow shirt and I've got a bookshelf behind me. I'm just going to go over a couple of little housekeeping <clears throat> items um, as we get started. We actually have nearly 500 people uh, registered to attend today. And while we know not all of you are watching this live, um, we think it really speaks to the interest and the importance of discussing and improving mental health in the documentary field. Um, a few housekeeping items. Um, first of all, if the other panelists could temporarily turn their cameras off, that would be great. Um, because uh, we have both ASL and BSL interpreters. We also have the ability to have AI-generated English captions, um, which you can click on the show captions at the bottom of your screen. Um, we are recording today's session um, for the benefit of those who could not attend live. Um, we are not live streaming uh, the session on any social media. Um, we will ask all of our speakers today to include a visual description, just as I did um, before they start speaking. We will be showing some slides um, that do include some graphics and quotes uh, from the port we report. We will share those slides, this video, and the report in a follow-up email. And those slides should have um, alternative text uh, for those of you who are dependent on screen readers. Um, feel free to use the chat uh, during the session to interact with other participants. Um, we will have time at the end for questions. Uh, if you do have questions, please do not use the chat, um, for, uh, but instead use the Q&A, um, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen. You can ask questions anonymously. Um, and before we meet the rest of the documentality team and dig into the Price of Passion report findings, um, we would like to welcome Asad Mohammed from American Documentary, POV, uh, one of our earliest supporters, um, to share a few words to get us started. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to welcome everyone to the report launch of the Price of Passion, hosted by Documentality. Greetings. My name is Asad Mohammed. And first, I just want to have a moment to speak to you as my own person detached from the organization I work for. Uh, these days, the burden feels very heavy. The grief is never ending. And I often find myself asking, what does wellness even look like? Uh, one of my favorite questions used to be, what does it look like? And the problem with that is that it's ableist and puts such a focus on what one may see or have me focus on identifying what a process may look like if I'm approaching a new project idea. But now I've reshaped what used to be one of my favorite questions to what does it feel like, which truly gets to the heart of the matter for me, uh, especially of what makes humans different from machines. And in these times, I feel like in the thick of future shock and robot culture, and the fact that we program films, make films, watch films, we also are not set up to stand by and watch over 35,000 Palestinians be killed, closer to 50,000 if you begin to count the people under the rubble and not say anything. Uh, in the genocide and free Palestine, I encourage folks to go to the website filmworkersforpalestine.org to read the solidarity statement and learn more. Again, my name is Asad Mohammed. For those just joining, I work at American Documentary POV, where I lead POV Engage, our community engagement and education team. A major part of my team's work is to resource communities of all kinds across the country. And one of the things that fell under my work as the vice president of impact and engagement strategy was to provide rapid response health and food grants to documentary filmmakers through a artist emergency fund we had for 
a, a number of years. And in June 2020, after supporting about 350 filmmakers with that program, we began, we started to contact filmmakers to pivot the leftover funds from that grant program into a new mental health fund pilot uh, that would support Black, Indigenous, and other filmmakers of color with mental health therapy support, consultations, and prescriptions. However, after a few days into the pilot, we decided to pause it. We heard back from Brown Girls Doc Mafia members on online platforms, and the critiques and feedback stated that our process marginalized people to relive trauma, asked artists to trust us and trust in institutions enough to be vulnerable with their mental health needs and be evaluated as they compete for funding. So that definitely didn't feel good. And every BIPOC director, producer, or interactive creator who applied to the mental health fund before the application was taken down was funded at 100% of the amount they requested. And we administered and as we were administering the pilot, one of our guiding principles was to trust people when they tell you what they need, especially as it relates to mental health. And by taking our remaining AMDOC pilot funds and investing it into documentality's research, we recognize that artists and people in documentary films are best positioned to determine their mental health needs and support interventions as they navigate the personal and political nonfiction storytelling that's happening. So, I'm asking you all to stay for as long as you can in this in this uh, event. And as at AMDOC, we're constantly reflecting on how our meetings may land on filmmakers, how to make things less intense, how to give people a heads up and how to be more considerate because we know that folks' mental health is at state. I just wanna thank all of you filmmakers to trust us for having conversations with documentality and for allowing us to make better choices on how we support mental health, even when the intention is, is something good, we have to think about the impact. So um, proud to say that we were able to be one of the first people to, to support documentality. And with that, I would like to hand it over to the documentality team. Thank you everyone for your presence, your time and your attention. Uh, hi, I'm Doug Block. Um, I'm the um, founder and one of the four co-hosts of The D Word. I am a, um, a white man of a certain age with grayish hair and grayish beard and um, wire rim glasses sitting in my home office with very warm lighting and a kind of big mess on the floor out of frame. Um, uh, I founded the D word uh, 25 years ago this August um, because I was, you know, I'd finished my second film and I was feeling kind of empty and depressed and um, frustrated and isolated and lonely and living in New York City. And um, I could only imagine what it was like for documentary filmmakers, you know, living in other parts of the US and in, in, in the world. And, um, uh, you know, this is, I, I, anyway, I felt like if, if, you know, there was no institutional support. And, um, and so we founded the D Word I, I, and, and along with my um, three co-hosts, um, Erica Ginsburg, Marge Safinia, and Peter um, Gerard, and um, Marge and Erica will be talking to you later. Um, we have since monitored, I don't know, the D word has grown to over 23,000 members from 161 countries, all by word of mouth. We've not done any kind of promotion or advertising. People just hear about it and they join, I mean, partly because it's free, it's a free online virtual community, but um, because they feel this need for community and support um, and companionship and um, some, you know, entity that will help them get through this. It's, it's just not a sustainable profession and we're all kind of in this together. Um, 
We have monitored over this quarter of a century, um, the four of us, I mean, well over 100,000 posts, probably closer to 200,000. So we know how documentary filmmakers and professionals feel. I mean, we probably have our pulse on it, unlike any others I can think of. And so we know firsthand what an incredibly challenging field we have chosen to be in. Um, and, but, you know, it's anecdotal. I mean, we know just because we've, heard, and, and it, it's only grown since the pandemic. We've started every Friday at this time, um, holding weekly Zoom meetings with our members. So we know firsthand how um, that it's become a, more and more of a crisis. And, and Erica and Marge will talk to that. But um, we needed, we felt like we needed to do something and have this documentality initiative because we needed to have data and research that has supported what we know to be absolutely true anecdotally. Um, and so I will leave it to our team to, to take it from here. Thanks, Doug. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca. Um, I run an organisation called Film and Mind. I'm a white woman of a certain age with um, a, a short, wavy brown bob um, and a pale pink top. And I'm sitting in a, my garden office, which is currently flooded with sunlight, which is very nice. And it's wonderful to see you all saying hi to each other and seeing who's here as your names pop up in the chat. I'm really pleased we're finally getting to do this. Um, I was a producer, for, I'm just going to give a really brief introduction um, to me and then my colleague Malik is also going to um, speak as well and then we'll dive into the report. But um, I was a producer for um, just over a decade um, uh, in Scotland, working with the Scottish Documentary Institute and just as I got to the point in my career where it should have been getting a lot easier, I decided to retrain as a psychotherapist. and. There were many reasons for that, a, a lot of which are in this report, um, but it was a it was a real revelationary time for me. And, you know, in my training as a therapist, I was suddenly being given all these um, tools and coping mechanisms that I wish I'd had as a documentary maker. And my path became very clear. Um, I wanted to bring all of that learning that I was having and that personal growth that I was experiencing um, into the documentary field. I think some of us have been doing this unofficially, um, quietly behind closed doors, and many of us were just feeling very adrift and unsupported. So over the last five years, I've been shaping um, what that can look like for, you know, working therapeutically within within the documentary field and, and really highlighting the, the many, many topics that are involved in, in mental health, in the mental health discussion. Um, so yeah, I'm, there's a lot to dive into today. So I'm gonna leave it there. But, um, that's me in a very short nutshell. Hi folks, um, my name is Malika Rollins and I'm a light-skinned African-American woman. I'm wearing glasses, short hair, and I have a brown kind of wall behind me. It is truly lovely to see you all here. I cannot even tell you. So um, I'm one of the documentality team and I was a social worker and therapist for about 10 years before I joined the documentary community. Social work is a very ethically based profession, just like documentary. And in fact, there's a lot of overlaps between social work and being a documentary filmmaker. And I work full time for Doc NYC. And that role as director of industry and education has really given me a front row seat to filmmaker experiences. And as I, ca I came in as a new person about two and a half years ago, and of course I was able to listen to filmmakers uh, attending various events. And what I observed was this deep, deep need for mental health education, support frameworks, um, as filmmakers, participants, crew, and even audience sometimes express tremendous sense of suffering, confusion, dejection, isolation, a feeling of, of, of being lost in, in many cases. And as a mental health professional, I was quite surprised that this incredibly intimate, relationship-based, stressful, ethically-based profession didn't have a mental health component. And I was lucky to meet the D-Worders and Rebecca, and we were off to the races. And who is our next speaker, y'all? I think it's me again, Melinda. I think it's you again, yep. 
Oops. <laughs> Hello again. Um, we've got a bit of a script here. Um, so I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how it all began. Um, and for me, it, and for me meeting everybody else, it, it all began in 2018 at IDA at the Getting Real conference. Um, I travelled to LA six months pregnant and uh, ran the first what we think was the first ever mental health panel at, um, at a film festival, the first big public conversation about mental health at a festival. And I was really, really scared. I had no idea, you know, I'd been, I'd just finished my training. I'd been thinking all these things and hadn't really brought it into um, conversation yet within the industry. So this was really, a, a, you know, a proper launch. And I didn't know how people were gonna respond. And we had a panel, we had four four other filmmakers on the stage with me and really dug deep into their films and, and what that how how those how making those films has impacted them emotionally. And it was a little bit like a, you know, like a sort of semi-therapy session on stage. And it was incredibly moving. And I think having been at festivals previously as a producer and always feeling like I was having to work very hard to um sell things suddenly I was just there and everyone was coming up and saying thank you afterwards for having that conversation and I, I noticed the uh, the sort of uh, relief and release in the room as we were, as we were talking about it um, and I ran a closed group as well during Getting Real after that with about 20 filmmakers where we just talked about these issues in more detail and it became very clear to me that you know therapy was needed specifically for filmmakers um, and that's kind of where it all began. And, you know, I, I met I met Doug at Getting Real as well. And, and we began talking about what we could do and through the D word. And, and later on, I met Malika and we'll, we'll come to those bits. But it was really that it was really that first launch um, at Getting Real. And then a month later, I went to IDFA as well and, and did something with their um, emerging filmmakers there. Um, so it all that was the beginning of it, really, and more and more festivals started getting in touch, and um, and they are still like you know lots there's lots of these panels now, which is amazing. But that first step was extremely nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, so Erica, over to you. All right. So as Doug mentioned, um, you know the D word has been this global virtual community for documentary filmmakers for 25 years, and really to help us not feel alone. Um, and personally, I mean, I joined the D word in March 2001, and so of course initially I found the community very helpful, you know, just in my journey of making documentaries. But when 9/11 happened, it really became a lifeline uh, for many of us navigating our own mental health you know, in the light of that tragic event and its aftermath. Um, but our community was shaken once again um, in spring of 2019, when one of our most beloved members, uh, Andrew Behrens, took his own life. And on the surface, Andy was a successful um, filmmaker, but really the pressures of too many terrible things witnessed, you know, if he filmed a lot in conflict zones, like many of us faced financial difficulties, um, and he also had a, a difficult medical diagnosis. So he received all of this without a sense of safety net. Um, so this all contributed to his decision. Um, so in the aftermath of that loss, we wanted to host a special topic to talk about mental health. Um, and we joined forces with Rebecca uh, for that effort. Hi everyone, I'm Marjan Safinia. Most of you call me Marge. Uh, I'm just going to introduce myself briefly. Uh, I'm a D Word co host. Uh, I'm a, um, a Middle Eastern woman, Iranian, with uh, just past shoulder length curly hair, blue top, in a uh, comforting office background. Um, so, as Erica said, in, in uh, July of 2019, so several months, maybe three months after Andy uh, died, um, we decided that we wanted to launch a special topic on the D word to talk about mental health. And we were, you know, really concerned about it because it's such a stigmatized topic and people feel so um, awkward talking about it, especially in a professional setting. And we weren't really sure how it would go, but it felt like something that we needed to do. And um, that's when, you know, we hooked up with Rebecca because we realized it was really important to have kind of um, trained professional with us in that space. And that's where this journey began. So we launched this uh, topic on the D word and um, remarkably and incredibly courageously, one of the very first posts was from another beloved 
community member who disclosed that they had also made a suicide attempt uh, a few years prior. And they spoke about it in such a moving and open way. Um, and um, in, a, in a way they opened the floodgates. They gave everybody permission to feel safe to, to talk about what uh, they were experiencing. Um, and it was the most extraordinary sort of cascade of um, real pain that I think people don't talk about with each other enough. Um, so that uh, week long topic that we had planned turned into a three week topic. It, as the three week topic was going, another filmmaker in the community uh, shared with us that her filmmaking partner had taken his own life. And we realized that this you know, really was a crisis. And so that uh, temporary topic is now a permanent topic on the D word. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna hand to Malika. This is Malika again. Um, so fast forward to 2020, and as you may recall, everyone, all of us were experiencing mental health crises of various forms. And all the underlying issues and concerns that had been kind of underground for a while had come to the surface in many regards. Um, I was able to moderate a panel hosted by Doc NYC and the D Word in December of 2020, where Re Rebecca was one of the speakers. And as we started to really grasp the effect that the pandemic had wreaked on the mental health of our whole community, we realized we had to go bigger if we were gonna be serious about this issue. We needed research to be able to show the scale of the issue and to formally bring it to the attention of the whole documentary ecosystem, which is what you all are part of today. Rebecca. Thanks, Monica. This is Rebecca again. Um, yeah, so we began to dream about what we could do for the documentary community to um, create something that was free to access, that wasn't owned by any one organisation, that came from a place of care and compassion, and most of all was led by the, need, the needs of, of filmmakers, your needs um, from speaking with you. So that was really the sort of main driver behind the research. And then, of course, we couldn't have done it without the support of our funders. And I, there's a big part of me that wants to say how we got involved with every one of you, because it's been amazing. Um, and I don't have time, but really it has, it has been, you know, it's been an incredible support. So some of you have come on as funding partners, some of you have come on as thought partners, some of you both, um, but we've had funding from American Documentary, and Asad spoke to you earlier about that, from BFI, um, Doc Society, Scottish Documentary Institute in Screen Scotland, the Scottish contingent, um, Documentary Film Council, which is a newly formed film council in the UK, it's a very exciting thing, Canada Media Fund and um, DOC, the Documentary Organisation of Canada, and Sarah's here as well to talk to us later, and so is Floor from SDI. So yeah, we're, we're very, very grateful um, for you, for, to you for supporting this research. Okay. Oh, it's me, it's still me. Okay, I think we're moving on into the report then. Um, okay, so something to say really briefly before we dive into the specifics of the report. I think the main overall feeling for us, and this is not something that surprised us, is that this is not a me failing problem. This is an ecosystem problem. Um, we've used this image here during during the um, focus groups that we ran with with filmmakers. We we showed them lots of images, um, and and asked them to pick ones that represented how they felt about the industry today. And this was one that was, as you can imagine, was picked very frequently. Um, so it's this you know this feeling of things being very very difficult and reaching out for help or not being able to reach out for help. But nothing in the report really surprised us. And I'm, I'm not sure when you read it, if it will really surprise you. I think what does surprise people is that, is that everyone is feeling the same or lots of people are feeling the same. The important thing is that we now have the beginnings of this research to back up what we what we know deep down. Um, it helps us see that these mental health challenges are, like, like it says here, not a me failing problem, but an ecosystem problem. Um, it also gives us, you know, the, the tools that we need to push forward to try and make more positive change. Um, before we dive into the specifics, there's a couple of things that really stood out for us. And one was the repeated presence of firsthand and vicarious trauma. Um, I know trauma, the word trauma is being used in the industry more now, um, but it wasn't, you know, a, a couple of years ago. And um, it was just this acknowledgement that 
there's just been a distinct lack of acknowledgement of it and a lack of training um, around how we come into contact with trauma in our work, um, both through our own experiences and that the experiences of our participants and how it affects us. Um, and the effects of that sort of become clear through the report as well. And the other thing we want to acknowledge is that in talking about, we know that talking about mental health is uncomfortable. It's really difficult, especially when it's a new thing, especially when we're talking about it for the first time and it's very personal and exposing. And the funders, institutions and executives are also feeling their own strains and limitations. Um, many want to help and simply don't know how to help. So we're delighted to see some of you here today. We're delighted that you participated in these conversations when we were doing the research um, they know they are part you you know you are part of the ecosystem and just not sure how to manage um, your impact on it so this is a this is an ecosystem conversation okay um okay so i'm just checking my notes I'm so i'm going to briefly talk about the methodology we use for our report as we dig into the meat of it so um, as you can see from the slide over about the course of a year we held 21 identity-based focus groups in the US, UK, and Canada. And those were the various identities that people could opt into if they wanted to. These were all optional groups. And the mixed group was anyone who wanted to, to, to join a more general group. Uh, we had about eight filmmakers per group. Each focus group met for three hours and was led by two trained facilitators who, were, who represented the, the identity of that group. I will also say that the reason we asked for, we, we got funding is so we could pay the people who were in the focus groups. That was really important to us. And the people who joined the focus groups were participants from nearly every role in the industry, from freelancers to salary folks. Um, and we established these identity-based focus groups to ensure a dedicated environment for individuals from historically marginalized identities to feel as safe as possible sharing these incredibly vulnerable stories about mental health struggles and strain. We were trying to address the additional challenges that these groups historically have faced and to provide a comfortable setting for discussing these topics. The aim was to foster open dialogue and understanding in a really respectful and supportive atmosphere. Um, now, Rebecca and I are gonna talk about, you can move to the next slide, um, Erica. So now Rebecca and I are going to walk you through some of the brief important highlights and stats from the from the report. So again, this is not going to be surprising to you all, but you know every thousand mile journey begins with the first step. And before we can actually name like fix a problem or address a problem, we actually have to name the problem. So filmmakers shared that that the doc industry's funding scarcity creates a really heartfelt struggle, especially from those from, um, from marginalized backgrounds. The emotional toll was quite evident as these creators face power imbalances, often feeling overlooked, undervalued. And the power imbalances really were between or are between filmmakers and folks who hold power, meaning funders. Um, the industry's structure really unfavors those with independent wealth. Um, filmmakers without financial support must endure a really daunting journey, investing, as we know, so much time and money with often very little hope for funding. Um, we all know that funders like really put their heart and soul into their jobs, but they're stressed and strained as well, very stretched thin. And the lack of feedback from funders kind of led to even more sense of disheartenment, dejection, despair, because all this work is put into funding applications and there's no feedback. The system, the funding system creates real power dis dis disparity, giving funders tremendous control and, and, and influence. Um, filmmakers told us they often felt like underdogs battling against these very powerful elite forces. Um, and the meager funding is so scattered with oftentimes broadcasters holding the keys as, as gatekeepers. So this is all that we heard again during the focus groups from the filmmakers. Rebecca? Thank you, Malika. Okay, so constant pressure and burnout. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this word burnout, and I wonder how many burnouts some of you have had. I know I've had a few. Um, this quote here, I was almost at a point of begging, I need to take a break here. Um, you know, many, every filmmaker in our focus groups had something to say about this pressure and burnout. Um, 
Eric, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide, because I'd quite like to use the quotes as a thank you, just as a sort of guide here. Um, this this comment really stuck out for me. It feels like we're crabs in a bucket just trying to make it out alive. It's this idea of, of you know, sort of scrabbling over each other to try and get the scraps um, feeling that a lot of people described, you know, the, the pressure to compete, the pressure to find some form of success and not really knowing what success looked like. Um, the sheer task ahead of you all for for making the films that you make, you know, the, everything that goes into it, and the, and struggling to complete all of that without with with a complete lack of resources and often a, a lack of a uh, team around you. So many of you working alone um, or in really really small teams and kind of juggling all the, all of these different roles often without um, acknowledgement of all of the different roles that you do, and then and also the sort of um, I'm going to come on to that in a minute around relationships, but the just sort of lack of understanding o over what the different relationships were. And what we were hearing was how burnout manifests as well. Um, I mean, I kind of know this as a therapist and a lot of us do who are doing this work, but I don't think a lot a lot of you in, in the focus groups even knew that you were experiencing burnout. You A lot of it was manifesting as illness. So, you know, burnout can look like constant headaches. It can look like insomnia. It can look like chronic fatigue. It can look like um, back pain. Um, you know, autoimmune, the development of autoimmune diseases. It can also look like anger. It can look like high levels of stress and anxiety. It can it can show up in many different forms. But what we know is that it makes working, continuing to work, very difficult. Um, so I'm sure many of us know people who have dropped out of the industry. Brilliant people who have dropped out of the industry, and some who had to take very very long pauses. Um, but it was, you know, just hearing all of that and and watching everyone in the group supporting one another through it in all of our focus groups was it was a very profound experience and it felt really important for us to be able to write it down in this way with these direct quotes from filmmakers thanks erica so interpersonal relationships and duty of care um this is this is a really varied topic you know when we're talking about interpersonal relationships here we're talking about how producers take care of directors how directors take care of participants and producers and the rest of the crew how producers are also trying to take care of the rest of the crew and participants but not really knowing them in the same way as the director um you know there's all these different circling relationships that are very very complex and nowhere to process it really um this this top quote here i'm just a filmmaker you know i'm not a therapist absolutely right that is absolutely right and i wonder why up until recent years the role of a therapist has not been more present in this work that we do because there is so much vulnerability um, and there's so much need for understanding how relationships work, what the dynamic is that exists within them. And, you know, as, as therapists, we have lots of lots of uh, support around us to help us understand that. And, and I think we really need it as filmmakers, too. And then and then if you do, if you are lucky enough to be able to afford a therapist, that there's often the feeling that they don't understand you. I've had two therapists when I told them the situation I was in, they immediately said you should stop making a film. And of course, anyone from the outside is going to say that. But, you know, we know why we're making films. We know why our heart is here. Um, and I think also when we're thinking about interpersonal relationships, it's about um, thinking about our own motivation and our own drive and how that need from us to make the film is impacting on other people, including the participants. So it's a big topic and very complex. Um, but, uh, you know, the, we're showing here also this last this last quote here is saying how films also impact on people in your life that are not connected to your film as well you know and that's that's a big thing we've heard of a lot of people who felt that they didn't have time for their children or it caused problems in their relationship um they felt very split like they were having to live separate lives often and they just didn't simply couldn't show up for everyone so there's a lot there's a lot to um to dive into there it was really it was um it was just incredible to have that insight from everyone as well and we're doing lots of work now around sort of how we can resolve that okay thanks erica um so vicarious trauma which i 
already mentioned um and you know we need workshops on this and and in fact the darts the dart center has actually done a lot of really useful work in the field of journalism to just to explain vicarious trauma and how, how it shows up for people but essentially it means it means um when you are exposed to someone else's trauma over a often over a long period of time, but also sometimes in a short period of time, depending on the severity of it, you can then display impacts of their, of their traumatic response um, within yourself. And I think a lot of filmmakers, once we started to describe that to them or you know, ask them questions about that, or they were revealing them in focus groups, they realized that that was what was going on. So the, the quote here is, it was hard knowing how much pain some of the people I was filming were in and then navigating notes that wanted to push for more entertainment. There's this feeling of how can I please the funder um, or the film organisation that I'm working with while also protecting the vulnerability and need of the participant that I'm filming with. Um, and that's just a constant dilemma for filmmakers that we really need to be able to solve. And I think sometimes that's where you know a, a third party can can really help there because we can say this absolutely ethically is not sound to be able to put this in a film um so we have got the title here if i care is trauma but i think this also links to first-hand trauma and often you know it becomes even more complicated when the filmmaker is making a film about their own trauma as so many of you are making personal films and so many of you who attended the focus groups were you know it's you're navigating this identity as both a filmmaker and um, a human being, a person, you know, with your own life outside of your filmmaking career. And you're trying to put both parts of you into this film experience. Um, and that leads to a very kind of complex traumatic experience sometimes where it's firsthand and, and almost vicarious and your film team ends up being affected by that as well. So um, there's a lot of need for us to be addressing this within the industry, not, not running away from it. You know, I don't think we should be avoiding um, issues of trauma and I don't, I don't think we should be afraid to work with it. But I think we need to learn how to do it properly and really understand how trauma shows up. Um, and a lot of people were asking for that in the focus groups, for that support. Okay. Um, so I, I facilitated two of the BIPOC focus groups. Um, and I have to say, uh, between those two experiences and also reading the transcript of the other identity specific groups, those were the most painful for me personally to be involved in because the pain is so deep. Um, there is a level of mental health stress and strain that we all feel, um, but when you add on a certain marginalized identity to that, you deepen, sadly, uh, the experience of mental health stress and strain. It is, it is, It was mind blowing to me. Um, and this quote, if anyone is from an, an under um, a, a marginalized group, this quote probably will not be unfamiliar to you. This humongous pressure that we have on ourselves from the outside that we have to get something right as a person of color, a woman, a, you know, a woman, someone who identifies as having a disability, we have to get it right. And if not, it messes up things for our entire group. And the and the and the folks who were in these focus groups particularly um, illuminated that. Can you go to the next one? Thank you. So my, I think it, if I have to have a favorite quote, I think my favorite quote from all of this is that you don't need a therapy, sorry, you don't need therapy, you need, you need a revolution. And I say that because I think that so beautifully speaks to the experience of both marginalized filmmakers, but really everyone in the sense that I really hope filmmakers walk away from this knowing that none of this is your fault or your issue or your problem as an individual filmmaker. The system is unfortunately quite dysfunctional and it is not truly built for compassion, support, understanding, et cetera. And folks from the marginalized groups really brought that out. Um, some of the things that they talked about were, as you can imagine, just the tremendous systematic barriers and just flat out discrimination um, towards them as folks from marginalized groups. Um, there is such a struggle they talked about for identity specific funding leading to even increased competition and divisiveness within these communities and an incredible frustration with being pigeonholed into creating only films that align with with the stereotype of who they are there was one filmmaker who walked in, who who said that when she walked into to to pitch meetings she, she felt like her her blackness walked in first so her skin color walked in the room first and then she walked in the room in terms of the reception she got from the folks who were on the other side of the table, which were often 
Caucasian people. Um, and there, there is this tremendous sense that this, this pigeonholing is, is, is an example of reducing people from marginalized groups to just their identity versus their entire holistic self as a human being and how, how painful that is for them and how painful the feelings are all the time when they're involved in filmmaking. And the lack of understanding oftentimes from, it could be white allies, it could be institutions, et cetera. But there is just such tremendous pain that I do not think needs to be there, but we are all responsible for it. And we all need, as we are trying to do now, and you're, you're here helping us to uh, help ameliorate this. Uh, I think I'm gonna move on now. You all hopefully have read the, have read the quotes. So uh, we, of course, want to talk about solutions because one of the amazing things about documentary filmmakers that you all know are they are incredibly resourceful, smart, creative people. And if you ask them, so here, you know, we know that about the problems, what can we do? They will have a flood of solutions. So the solutions part of our report is quite long. We're, we, we don't have time to go into all of it, but here, here are some examples. Um, especially BIPOC filmmakers definitely talked about the need for ongoing um, training, if you will, to really hold the people in, in power accountable for racial inequalities that really bar them from access and opportunity. And like a couple of simple examples that I think actually are not that hard and not that expensive that all film organizations can do to kind of combat a lot of this is hiring an outside person to come and do um, bias training inherent bias training, implicit bias training, of which there are many organizations that actually can offer that training, which can go so far to, to reducing a lot of the discrimination that these filmmakers talked about. Um, a lot of filmmakers talked about this idea of needing um, more financial security through some, some government funding and also some also just more grant grant based funding from, from organizations but for example a universal basic income which we know some countries have tried to do a more more flexible more flexibility with how filmmakers were able to use grant funding so for example maybe you need to hire a caregiver to help watch your child for eight hours or six hours so you can actually work on your project so they really crave more flexibility in how they were able to use their their funding can you go on, Rebecca? Oh, I will also say that one filmmaker, or several filmmakers talked about overthrowing capitalism as kind of the main solution. Um, they, they very much wanted um, a, a more democratic, transparent funding process. So really like pulling back the veil on, on how the funding process operates because it's so opaque, it is so confusing, and which leads to incredible stress and strain for these, for these filmmakers. And some of them had ideas like inviting filmmakers to be part of grant grant funding um, opportunities, uh, vetting gatekeepers more and educating them. Again, this implicit bias training that I that I talked about, having term limits on on commissioners. So you can only have your job as a grant funder for five years, for example, which I think they, they actually do in some of the Scandinavian countries. Um, again, more 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 training about anti-bullying, harassment, racism, et cetera. And then lastly, sorry y'all, um, they, they also wanted to, to bridge the gap between funding, sorry, funders and filmmakers. One of the things that we learned a lot about, especially when, when we had a funder focus group at, at, at CPH Docs is this tremendous kind of Grand Canyon chasm between the filmmakers and funders. The funders have their own stress and strain that filmmakers don't know about and filmmakers feel very silenced and um, devalued oftentimes by funders and how can we come together and actually have some some vulnerable conversations among those two groups that we think can create tremendous positive energy commitment possibility. Thanks, Monica. You next, Rebecca. Yeah. Great. Um, so moving on to sort of more more mental health specific um, solutions, more open conversations and safe spaces to connect with peers. I think this is one of the biggest requests from people was that they felt lonely. Loneliness and isolation just came up all the time and they really wanted some support in how they can, a lot of people were setting up um, informal peer structures, peer support groups that were often collapsing because it was quite tricky to, um, 
to keep to sustain them and you know it takes up a lot of time it's more volunteering time it's more energy more emotional energy as well so how, how can we do that in ways that feel more sustainable um, support in creating well-being contracts for how co-creators and crew treat each other on projects um, I think we definitely need something more formalized within the industry you know right documents that we can share with each other resources that we can all share and use so that we're not having to create them from scratch every single time there's nothing formalized yet for us this well-being contracts um, and not just for how we're working with participants, but also for how we're working um, with each other. There are a few resources out there and we are going to be adding resources to the documentality website shortly. Um, awards for best mental health practices. This was suggested by a few people. I have, it's an interesting one because there's an, an idea of should we be, how do we, how do we put success, ideas of su success onto, onto mental health practices? Um, but it feels important to, to offer out all the solutions and we have to figure out the, the most ethical way to, to around whether or not these things can happen and how we make them happen. Um, connect and back into more interconnection and support, these facilitated support, peer support groups, which we actually just, that was one of the things that we developed immediately after the focus groups was a peer support training program. So taking groups of filmmakers, training them to facilitate their own um, peer support groups and then um, supporting them for six months while they while they ran those groups and we've, we've run it three times now and it's been hugely successful of course it needs funded because we don't want filmmakers to pay for that because it is more time that they are volunteering to help each other so um, we're always uh, keen to hear from funders who <coughs> want to um, people were asking for more mentorship, but again, how do we formalise that? Because it's happening unofficially and it adds to this feeling of not being valued all the time and, you know, people people putting in a lot of work that somehow isn't getting recognised. So how can we make mentorship more of a, a recognised thing? Um, more parity between filmmakers and funders listening to filmmakers pushing for change you know this is this is the dialogue we're, we're hearing about this um split between filmmakers and funders the us versus them issue um how can we bring people together to talk about things more openly without fear um and using compassion <coughs> language. and here we haven't mentioned yet the the model of film supervision um that i've been developing over the past couple of years um and i won't go into it in too much detail here because it's um it's it's a lot to explain but it's a it's a form of support that's similar to therapy in some ways but it's actually more focused on your film work so we're looking at ethics and responsibility and accountability relationships um and your own your own including your own relationship with the film um so it's very much support for you for you and your filmmaking practice um or for any you know anybody working within within the film team we're also working with producers and impact producers um, and really exciting news, which I can't say officially yet because we're still doing the paperwork, but I've just got some uh, some funding support through Film in Mind to actually roll out supervision, um, to evaluate it properly, to, to offer subsidised supervision support services to filmmakers. So if you want to hear more about that, um, we'll we'll be announcing it through Documentality and through Film in Mind at some, at some point in the near future. But it's really exciting because we can work with you at a much discounted rate um, and we can properly come up with a name that works for the for the model and get it um, embedded within the industry. And it should hopefully be funded as well through all the film budgets. Um, so lots of change coming. And this is this brings us into this built in mental health support is, um, you know, we need to be seeing this. It needs to be a standard standardized approved line item in the budget. And it, need, it needs to be open. There needs to be an openness about how mental health support can be implemented. We don't always need to be working with therapists. That's not a solution for everything. There are many, many other things out there that can support us in this. Sometimes filmmakers need retreats. Sometimes they need um, facilitators to come in and work with their teams for a day and talk to them about, you know, how that how they communicate with each other, um, how they resolve conflict. There's many, many different ways that we can be including mental health support, um, but it needs to be allowed in the film budgets. And what we've discovered so far is that people aren't complaining about that. Funders aren't complaining about that. They support it. OK, back to you, Monika. Um, again, putting on my my social worker hat for for a minute, um, the, as we've been talking about, so many of these issues are systematic. And filmmakers talked a lot about needing and wanting some kind of more systematic um, frameworks for things like reporting abuse and mistreatment. 
um, either on crew with different production companies, but there's no kind of human resources. There's no body to go to, to actually report any kind of abusive behavior, which we know unfortunately happens all the time. Ideally people just wouldn't be abusive. Like that is the goal, but unfortunately it does happen and there's no place to take that. So they were talking about some kind of union, for example, some sort of eight, like large documentary HR department, if you will, um, very near and dear to my heart. Um, as a social worker, we have a three page single space code of ethics. And like I said, documentary filmmaking has tremendous overlaps with social work. And we too need a code of ethics. We need ethical frameworks and roadmaps to help filmmakers navigate the ethical dilemmas that frankly you all face daily especially when it comes to how to treat part, treat and protect participants, the responsibilities that you have to your crew, even to the audience, especially if your topic is about a very traumatic experience. So I don't know if, if, if a union is the answer, but definitely filmmakers talked about some kind of body to help regulate um, some, sometimes mistreatment, but also things like really wanting much more reasonable working hours and reasonable pay, et cetera. Um, can you move on, Erica? I think this is you, Rebecca, right? Yeah, this is me again. Thank you. This is our last slide of solutions. Um, so childcare or caregiver line items. There were there were lots of people in our focus groups who were parents um, or caring for someone at home. And it's really, really difficult to work um, without the support um, of, a, of a caregiver line item or, you know, how you can show up for filming, how you can be present or even how you can do things at a, at a slower pace than than other people might be able to do because you have these because you have other responsibilities. So um, and of course, it disproportionately affects women in the field. And I know we heard from a lot of women who had actually put off having children um, because they didn't they couldn't didn't feel that they could do both or well, we just don't mention our kids and that's also something actually in itself it's like you sort of reduce that part of you um, and that was mentioned a lot which I think is um, not something we feel we should do um, so lots lots of work to be done around there um, documentary informed mental health support so one of the one of the key things about film in mind as a therapy service is that every therapist who works through Film in Mind has um, documentary experience, which means that we don't come to the table um, or, the, or the therapy room with the judgment of, um, of why you're making films. We, you know, we, we understand what this process is. We're, we're passionate about it and, and, and about providing that support. Um, and I think um, you might be surprised to hear this, but well, maybe not. But there are a flood of filmmakers retraining as um, as therapists at the moment. I can see Rebecca Sosa just put a little comment there. She's one of them, um, was working in the field and is now retrained as a therapist. And I'm getting approached by people every every couple of weeks saying, "Can I have a chat about the work that you do?" So I think there's going to be quite a, a you know a team of us soon who, who all have this experience and and can work with you in non judgmental ways. Um, because at the moment there's not enough of us, but I think there will be. You're right, Marge, it is a natural skill transfer set. <laughs> Absolutely. Because we're because it's very, you know, the motivations for doing the work is very similar. I think with therapists and filmmakers, it's it's really, really similar. Um, Just one more sentence, sentence of hope, piggybacking on Rebecca, is that the the select the the solutions that filmmakers suggested is an incredibly large portion of our report so we're just giving you a quick overview but there's so many more detailed concrete suggestions that they had so just just to let people know there is there is some hope out there who's next still uh i believe i am and um i'm first of all i just want to acknowledge everybody for the incredible and generous sharing that's going on in the chat um, and you will be able to save it. Um, I hope you will, because there's a lot of resources and ideas in there. Um, I want to, at this point, uh, introduce and bring on camera two of our early funders of documentality, Sarah Spring, Executive Director at um, the Documentary Organization of Canada, and Flora Kosker, the Director of the Scottish Documentary Institute. Um, Sarah, I understand you're attempting to pilot a mental health program only to find that filmmakers are hesitant because they still feel this stigma around it. And I wonder if you could, you know, talk about that and ways you're trying to overcome that. 
Thanks, Doug. I'm really happy to be here. And I, you know, we were just talking about like balancing kids and stuff. So I actually have to leave in, in a few minutes to go do something at my kid's school. I'm really sorry. Um, but I'll be able to just speak quickly about that. So, um, yeah, I mean, really out of the documentality uh, collaboration, it really informed everything we do at DOC. And so we started with our next major program that we funded, um, which was supporting six production companies over the course of a year uh, with like production accounting support, legal uh, consultation, um, producer mentorship. So we put prepaid therapy as part of that um, because it was so like, that was just one of the clear recommendations that came out of this. And it's really interesting um, to see how there is still a bit of hesitancy on how, or like shyness around how to access that. Um, and also just, you know, what's really interesting is not everyone, I think this was already mentioned, but never, not everyone needs a therapist. Three of our participants are Indigenous, and there's certain therapy that's covered by the Canadian government because of genocide against Indigenous peoples perpetuated by the government through residential schools and et cetera. So different types of support um, are important. And that was so I think also as a as the partner there, just to be like, well, we can be really flexible. You know, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're an organization that is there to just try to be responsive to the community. We're not an enormous institution. So yeah, just being flexible and saying whatever people need to center well-being. So that was an interesting, like in our first step towards um, centering mental health and well-being, just to the immediate understanding that we need to be really flexible um, and just really listen on what does that mean for everybody. I think also the more we talk about mental health and it's destigmatizing it just by the nature of being open about it and um, our, our own mental health issues. Um, thanks for being here, sir. I know, I know you're, you're challenged for time. Um, Floor, um, can you tell us about the universal basic income project that, you know, I understand you're looking for research and development funding? Thank you, Doug. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Floor. I'm a white woman in my 40s. I'm wearing a sleeveless green top and I'm sat in front of a white background. Um, so we're quite lucky in Scotland because we have a very compact size industry and that really allows us to use it as a test bed for many things. So in the past few years, what we've done is we've very much placed equity at the center of everything we do. So taking individual needs into consideration to um, to make sure we reach an equal outcome. And um, we have been listening um, to the filmmakers and the producers we work with on a daily basis. We've been listening to what their experience has been um, throughout the pandemic and it made us realize that yes of course we needed to um, absolutely try and support the shift from project-led support to more filmmaker based support so not just saying we're investing it on one project we're, invest we're investing in a filmmaker in an artist um, but that's you know, that's not enough. <laughs> and the idea of these universal basic income um, was something we started discussing internally. It's a it's a dream at this stage, and there is a lot we need to do first, but we believe that with a bit of core funding at the beginning, we can, uh, we can move quite fast. And the idea would be on a rather small scale, but would be to support um, a few filmmakers from Scotland every year who are in the distribution phase of a feature film and preparing for their next feature and basically offering them a salary for one year. And if you trust people, miracles happen. If you're supporting the filmmaker when they're very lonely distributing their films that they've made, they've, it's taken them years and years to, um, to, to, to come to fruition. If you help them also with securing an income whilst they face um, postpartum depression. I was really happy to see this concept touch upon in, in the report, this, this idea that you've worked for so long and you put your film out into the world and then, well, you feel very tired and very empty. And 
chances are you need to go back to um, a job because you have to pay taxes, you have to pay food for your kids. Um, if you are of the, um, if you have the opportunity to just take a moment and focus on what could come next, or just take a moment and clear your head, then chances are you're gonna you're gonna work better and faster, and we want to be the one supporting that. So as I said, it's very it's a very small scale. It's not a universal basic income project for all artists in Scotland, as much as we, we would like to do that. But the idea is to um, um, write down and and share with everyone the blueprint, what we've done, the kind of advisory groups we've put together, the kind of people who've um, um, helped supported us and how the problems that we've faced in the hope that other organizations internationally can also use that blueprint and, and create the same, um, the same projects. Thank you, Flora. Uh, you know, we love having you here in part because you're, you know, in a sense, a funder, a gatekeeper in a sense. And, you know, getting back to what Malika said earlier, you know, we want to show a human face to the gatekeepers. They have their own mental health challenges. You, you know, so many are underfunded and, and resourced themselves. Um, I think of film festival programmers and heads who um, are facing myriad challenges these days, including, you know, think of the job that they have, which is saying no to 95% of the people who apply for, um, you know, programming or funding. And so, you know, it's really important that we have this dialogue and communication and don't see it as an us versus them issue. Um, so thank you so much for your jumping aboard earlier and supporting us. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, back to you, Erica. Thanks, Doug. I'm gonna share the screen again. But in the meantime, I also wanted, I know there's a lot of chatter in the chat going on about saving the chat. I know it looks like some of you do see the three dots, some of you don't. Be assured, we will get you the chat um, in our follow-up email that will be coming tomorrow. So don't worry, you will all have access to the chat. And I'm just gonna share screen again. Give me one second here. All right, so, um, so what's next uh, for Documentality? Um, so we are going to be creating resources for filmmakers on our website um, that will include building um, a therapist directory. Um, I know that uh, Rebecca talked about Film in Mind has been piloting these supervision groups. Um, so we'll probably be talking about those as one case study. And we'll also be building case studies that model other successful centering of care um, you know, in documentary projects. Um, and then uh, we'll be working across the documentary ecosystem uh, to really try to bring this subject out of the shadows and reduce the stigma uh, around mental health. And I'm turning it over to March. Uh, no gathering of documentary filmmakers would be complete without talking about a need for more funding. Um, so we, as Documentality, are looking to continue to expand uh, this work, and we're looking for funding support from our institutions um, to help us conduct additional layers of research. Um, I think it's no surprise to anyone who's been paying attention that it's not just filmmakers who are suffering, but many of our colleagues who work inside organizations across our field clearly are also suffering. Um, we've seen, you know, um, real crumbling uh, uh, of business as usual in many of our big institutions. And we think this is a really important piece of the ecosystem too, that we have to understand. Um, it's not in fact us versus them, it's all of us versus capitalism. <laughs> and so um, we'd like to con uh, conduct additional research um, with our institutions to understand uh, the pressures that folks in there are facing. Um, we want to really work directly with more of our funding organizations to help normalize this idea of line items for mental health in budgets and standardize that um, and to sort of prompt filmmakers, not that we need more questions on our core application, but really to prompt filmmakers to think about care uh, and how they are um, bringing it to fore in their films. I think we all saw that when we prompted filmmakers, when funders prompted filmmakers to talk about 
um, you know, their relationship to the story, et cetera, things started to shift. So it's a good way, it's a good access point to, to create um, change. Um, and this last piece I think is really important. One of the things that we learned, uh, Rebecca and Malika did conduct two um, informal focus groups with some funders and institutions. And one of the things that we learned is that they all don't talk to each other about this issue enough. Um, and so everyone is trying to, they want to help, but they don't know how. And they find themselves, um, you know, throwing throwing things at the wall. And um, if they could be in a learning community together, it would probably accelerate the pace of change for everyone. Um, so that's also something that we want to do is create that network for them to talk specifically about how collectively uh, they can help be part of the solutions for, for mental health change. So that's some of what's next. If there are funders in the room or you know funders who are interested in this work, please have them reach out to us. I'll drop a link in the chat for how to email all of us at Documentality. Erica, you want me to keep going? These are our special, uh, this is just, you know, because we all, the labor is uh, plentiful and uh, we want to make sure everyone's acknowledged. These are the folks who've helped us get here to this stage so far. Um, and uh, if uh, we're going to move into a Q&A section now. So if you have additional questions, please drop them in the chat. We've been answering some, there are some there. Um, and we'll open it up to that. And thank you for your patience hanging with us so far. Questions. We're just going through them now, y'all. Uh, yes, Don. Uh, we'll, we will have more re more resources for free and available on our on our website. Don was asking more about resources. Um, they will be more on our they'll be on our website. And yes, we are going to make make a therap um, a therapist directory, which will go up on our website very soon. We are we are we are very close to it. Um, and so you people can, people will be able to go onto the website and search for therapists who have some background with um, with documentary filmmaking. Are we doing any research and or providing resources for film students, especially ones from marginalized communities? Who wants me to, to help me answer that one? Rebecca, I'll jump in. I'm, I'm going I'm <laughs> to say not, not at this moment. I mean, much like everything yeah. else in our field, unfortunately, the, the solutions are figured out by us, by filmmakers, right? By folks who are suffering the problems. And so we also have, you know, limited uh, capacity and we want to really focus in the next phase um, on our institutional partners because we think they're a, a hugely influential part of the ecosystem and hopefully after that. But I agree with whoever made that comment, but we don't teach kids and film students enough about the reality of the film world. And I would really hope that those of you who are in academia would try to find ways to bring this conversation into your classrooms because we're not really prepared. We prepare them for a bountiful you know, career where their artistry will be recognized and then it's a hard, you know, a rude awakening uh, when they actually enter the field. So, I, I, you know, if, if there are academics, you know, we're happy to help work with you to try to figure out ways that maybe you can lead some of bringing that into the classrooms. Mm -hmm. I think my um, jacket... Alex, oh, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, just to, just just to follow up on that, is I, I do get asked by universities quite a lot to go and speak, but it's just a, it's a result, it's a time resource issue. So unless we either need more people, or better yet, we would just have an, an education resource that uh, you know we can share with universities at, at the very least, and then we can do the more in depth work when we have a larger team. But yeah, we, we'll get there. I hope. <laughs> Sorry, Malika, I cut you up there. That's okay. Um, I'm going to throw this question. I think to 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 Marge or Doug about why hasn't a union like a documentary union taken off? Alex has this question that you know it's hard, to, hard maybe impossible to overthrow capitalism. So, but why hasn't a union taken off? Because Alex thinks that mental health is a band aid for larger, larger issues that are systematic, which we totally agree with. Um, and a union could be very effective. But I think Marge and Doug, etc., have been around much longer than I have, and may have some history with that. Well, I, we haven't been around that long, Malika. We're still spring well, chickens. I mean, but um, I mean, in the industry, it, Marge. <laughs> but it has. It's it's a very um, it's a rich topic of conversation. Every few years, it cycles around. We need a documentary union. 
and as a matter of practice, we all understand that even when we use this word ecosystem or the word industry, it's such a vast, you know, there's so many different people at so many different levels and to corral that into one systemic thing where the people on the other side, the ones with the money actually care, we, we're, not in, we're not in that situation. And unfortunately, even within the existing unions, the director, you know, the, and the guilds, the director's guild, the producer's guild, et cetera, um, there's their documentary is sort of the um, the un, unlicked pup of those um, of those institutions. So um, as a matter of practice, it's a really difficult thing to corral such a diverse um, set of experiences into a union. But what we do have in the documentary field is really activated collectives. I saw somebody else, Connie, you put a question about how do we like gather this information? I think this is a really important piece that maybe some of our institutional partners should also be listening for. There's so much research. Just this last two weeks, I've got like five different reports, all of them 50 pages long, open on my desktop and I need to read them. And these get just lost in the ether. So I think that having someone create um, kind of like a JSTOR, like a one place, one stop repository for, for all the learning would really help mm -hmm. us. And I'm certainly, yeah. uh, it's a conversation I have with funders uh, often. I haven't yet mm -hmm. had a persuasive one, but I'm working on it. And I think it's a really good idea. We need that. We also have to take yeah. into account the fact that, you know, this is, uh, we, we are so often forced into working with no budgets, you know, or low and get our, our projects off the ground without funding and somehow find a way to get our, you know, our films to the point where we can make samples or show, you know, a teaser or something that will lead to funding. So, you know, and, and the filmmakers are often the last to pay themselves. So it's, it's just, um, you know, I think it goes back to a systemic issue of where, you know, we would love to have more government funding, more institutional funding um, that we just don't have. Certainly in the US, we don't have. Um, so, you know, the idea of unions, I, you know, I, I think is important, an important discussion, but it, on, on some level to a vast majority of those who work in, in documentary, it's, it's kind of unrealistic. And just to build um, on that, because I saw Honda had asked, is it possible to find ways to make films together without funders? I mean, that's probably a little bit beyond the scope of what documentality is doing. But um, AI. A, a, no, a lot of filmmakers are, you know, do barter. Um, you know, it, it's not impossible to do. Um, and in, for some people, it actually, you know, if they have the ability to do that, maybe they work in another job and that's how they support their documentary work. Um, it may save their mental health in some ways, but uh, but I, we also don't believe it's realistic um, for the vast majority of projects. And so that's why we can't talk about mental health without the elephant in the room, which is funding. Um, I'd like Rebecca Milika, there's two questions here about the process of creating the data, which uh, maybe you guys can uh, just cover a little more. Mm -hmm. So can you expand on how we design the focus groups and then give a little bit of an overview of how we spent the funds that we did raise um, uh, because we're talking about transparency and we can be mm -hmm. transparent too. Of course, yeah. We, we did a quite far and wide outreach effort between the UK, US, UK, and Canada to documentary filmmakers to join the focus groups if they wanted to. And we asked them as part of the, uh, the expression of interest to fill out like a short paragraph about why they wanted to join this, this type of group. And then folks could, folks could opt in to the identity specific groups if they wanted to. Do you want to add to that, Rebecca, or is that? Yeah, because I think they were also asking about structure. So we, we worked with an independent oh. Um, researcher who spoke with Malika and I about what it was that we wanted to what it was that we wanted to find out and we came up with a structure for the groups um, mm -hmm. and a lot of you know a lot of our the questions that we had were coming from the conversations we've been having with filmmakers through through my work as a therapist and also on various panels that we were attending and, and, and everything so we decided the best way to structure it would be was, was in these three sections and the first was um, what does mental health mean to you and, and on a personal level um, how are you personally affected um, what's your mental health and then within in, in, on an industry level so how is your mental health 
working within this ecosystem and then the third part was solutions and that felt you know it was really important to have that solutions part in there as well and then we just we threw some exercises in there as well like the visual exercise where mm -hmm. um people looked at these images and said you know we asked them pick an image that um that represents how you feel about being in the industry, existing in the industry right now. And then we asked another group to pick an image that represented how, how they would like the industry to feel in five years, five years time or 10 years time in the future. And that was mm -hmm. a, you know, that was a really um, meaningful exercise and, and gave us a lot of insight into how people were feeling and what they wanted. Um, and then in terms of, um, another really important thing and Malika I'm not sure if you if you, I can't remember if you said this earlier sorry if I'm repeating myself here but it was really important to us that we paid everybody who attended the groups mm -hmm. and the reason they were only run in the UK US and Canada is because that's where our funding came from and we absolutely wanted to pay everyone um, because mm -hmm. we wanted to one of the things we were demonstrating is a value of time we, we really value mm -hmm. your time anyone who took part um, and we also valued our time so Malika and I needed to you know and everyone working on this um, mm -hmm. needed our time to be covered too and then a lot of the funding also went into promotion um you know the outreach that we've done on it and creating the report our lovely report writer claire and the designer mm -hmm. on the report and yes it swiftly went <laughs> uh, can you guys talk a little bit kevin has a question about the relationship between can you talk about the relationship between subject and producer how carrying the burden of their story affects the producer as well as their colleagues mm -hmm who may not understand what the producer deals with. Uh, the workplace, such as it is, can set up the producer as caring too much about the subject or story. That's a big question. Ooh, yeah, I'm taking a breath on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I do I mean I have yeah I mean I used to be a I used to be a producer so I was a producer for 10 years and now I work mostly with directors and that's really that's been really insightful for me and what I see a lot of the time is that directors don't often know what their producer is doing and producers don't often know what the director is doing and I think this I know you asked about producer and subject but I think this can be a really a big issue is it's often it's around communication it's like where where is the time within everyone's busy schedules to sit down and share about you know um learn from each other about your experiences your shared experiences and your individual experiences um making the, making the film and also what the need is and i think sometimes the producer feels quite distant from the relationship between yeah. the director and the participant um and that can be that you know that can be quite divisive within that really really important and potentially codependent relationship um that sometimes feels a bit toxic or um like you're not being supported whereas really everyone's sort of you know trying to achieve a, a shared goal but the visions don't always feel like they align and mm -hmm. i mean it's really hard to answer this question in, <laughs> in like a minute or yeah. something it's a big one. It is. yeah yeah maybe that touches on the complexity of it. Yeah. What else is there, Marge? Uh, yeah, we have uh, an well, I'm, oh, Sorry, we have I'm an about to answer. I'm oh. about to answer that one in, in text. Awesome. Uh, but, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just answer it here since we're talking about it. So someone's asking about when we're talking about doing additional research within um, institutions, how do we protect folks from the power, power dynamics at play, right? How do we um, make sure that their jobs, et cetera, don't get compromised or put on the line for their sharing? So as with this research, it's anonymous, right? You don't, we're not sharing so-and-so said such and such. Uh, in fact, with this research that is already out, um, I don't even know who all the attendees in the focus groups were. We don't know that that's really limited to, to the facilitators in the group. And what we're sharing back is an aggregate impression of people's feelings and the, the commonalities of the experience. It's very much not about, you know, um, highlighting any one person's uh, sp uh, specific uh, identifiable information. I will also say, and I think I said this earlier, but I'm just going to repeat it. I don't think that the folks in our institutions are our enemies. I think they are also <laughs> on team with us, right? And they mm -hmm. also work in really complicated, if anyone's worked in the nonprofit structure, it's incredibly mm -hmm. draining. It's incredibly under-resourced. It's incredibly stressful for everyone from the top mm -hmm. down. And none of us are perfect. I think part of this conversation about mental health is acknowledging that you know the human experience is a frail, right? And, and we all stumble and we all make mistakes and we all sometimes don't show up as our best selves. 
And if we can create an environment where this stuff can be discussed um, and there's a climate of safety to bring up this stuff, then that will really help us. So um, mm -hmm. we certainly wouldn't want to compromise any of our colleagues who are working inside institutions. In fact, um, I, as I said, we are very, it's very evident the pain that they're in as well. So it's mm -hmm. um, very much about protecting that with the goal being we're all in this together. None of us want it to be like this for the people who care so much about this stuff and how can we work on it together? Agreed. Uh, okay, so, and we did talk about the um, actual numbers about what funding was raised and ideally from where, we, we, I think we addressed that. I, I, I can't recall in the end what our total, I think we raised about 50, is that is that number right? Mm -hmm. It's a bit more than that, I think. Uh... I think it's more. I know we got twenty five thousand from POV that I right, Erica. Isn't that yeah, yeah. So you the you know each of the different countries uh, contributed different amounts. Yeah. Um, if someone really wants to know those numbers, we're happy to share them. Um, yeah, and also um, uh, uh, Sarah's gone now, but in Canada they also created um, you know they they gave us funding to run the groups in Canada and they themselves also wrote a report for the Canadian industry you know out of what had happened in the Canadian reports. Um, it's not possible obviously to, to to survey every filmmaker in the world, but what we want to do is kickstart the conversation um, and and it belongs to all of us. So hopefully others will take lead and and have these conversations in all in all of their own spaces as well. And then um, there was a second part to that question, which was how much more do we need to raise for the next phase? Uh, for the very next phase, I would say we probably need to raise about the same again. We're probably looking for something in the neighborhood of, uh, well, for the additional research, we're probably looking for something similar in the neighborhood of maybe like 75. But what we really want to do is build out this resource thing, right? And be able to, to um, subsidize, help subsidize perhaps people who need um, uh, support and can't get it. Um, so, I mean, I, I, you know, because uh, I like to ask for big numbers, I would say that we would really be looking to raise about 200,000 in the next round um, based on what this research has told us so that we can dig in deeper um, and start to understand more. Mm -hmm. And I don't think documentality, you know, these five people, six with Peter, you know, we can't, we're not, we're not going to fix it. Like we're not, you know, like nobody's coming to save any of us. We all have to participate in these solutions. And so mm -hmm. we hope that, like I said, it, we, we've kickstarted something that others will now pick up and do in-house as well. Because somebody asked the question of would we, you know, would we partner with other organizations who are doing this work? And yes, absolutely. We, we would, mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we partnered with DOC to do the work in Canada. We've just partnered mm -hmm. with Peace Loud, Peace, Peace Loud on, on some more research for participants. Um, you know, mm -hmm. these partnerships are springing up as a result of this, and we're very, very open to collaboration because we're not experts in this. We're just being being guided by what mm -hmm. we're hearing um, and trying to react to that. So I think, you know, any form of collaboration is welcome. And, and somebody also asked how we can collate everything together. And I think if people have resources that they want us to share and be aware of for the website, then please, please email it to us. And we'll take a look at everything and we're going to be building our resource hub because it's certainly not, the resources are not only things we're providing, you know, Film in Mind is a service provider, but by any, we're not by any means the only one. There are brilliant, brilliant people doing amazing things already and we want to list everything that we can that feels helpful. Um, so, yeah. I just wanted to add a note which which occurred to me as we were, were building this. You know, everything moves slowly, right? It's more slowly than we'd like it to. And I will say that I think that the situation for folks has gotten significantly worse from the time that we stopped doing these focus groups and started um, um, turning our attention to uh, digesting the, the data and writing it. Um, you know, the climate is really, really difficult now. And, and the silver lining, if there is one, is that I can name like five people at least I know who are moving into therapeutic support services of all kinds from this. Yeah because we understand the pains and we understand, you know, how to address them. So um, I do think we're going to face a shift, but it's rocky out there. It's, there's no sugarcoating it. It's really, really difficult for people. And we may find that in this moment where distributors can't function, nobody's like buying anything. We may find that people are like, we don't, we can't invest in mental health, right? That is, you know, a real possibility as well. So we have to see this as a long-term 
um, kind of culture change effort, right? Uh, as opposed to like a, a fix, it's not going to be a fix. Um, uh, I won't get into politics, but you know, that <laughs> that's not getting any better either. So we just, what we want to try to do is make this a thing that we can acknowledge. This is somewhere where I'm suffering. This is something that I'm having stress. Here are some tools for how we can resolve this within our pro production, you know, in this difficult conversation I need to have, you know, we're not going to solve the problem or, you know, soup to nuts. We're just going to try to provide guidelines for how to navigate this stuff as it comes up. And Mark, you know, you gave the example early on about um, how when we opened our topic, our mental health topic, discussion topic, that having one person share their you know vulnerability in such a powerful way just opened it up for everyone to join in and so we're hoping you know that um we can as a community be more open with our own challenges because the more we discuss it the less stigma there is around it um you know maybe maybe you know the term mental health um there's some built-in resistance I, I i like to think of it as well-being um as well mm -hmm. uh, yeah so okay we'll take one last tiny tiny question i don't think we have a, a a numeric answer but dawn is asking for those of us developing budgets for future documentary features and series projects is there a percentage of budget that is recommended to include in the line uh, rebecca I, it's it's more about what is your specific need right it's a case assessment. I think so i think it's a case by case because not yes. you know not not everybody's going to need it some everyone will, mm -hmm. will need different things some people will need you know there's going to be a very intense need for participants and for crew and sometimes just for crew and you know it's really really varied and i think it's about sitting mm -hmm. down at the very beginning of the project and saying what are the risk factors here and what mm -hmm. support can we in place so that we're doing this in the best possible way and part of this you know because even even if the ecosystem solves itself and we become a healthier more compassionate um you know sort of industry that's less fraught with mental health issues we're still going to be making films about really difficult subject matters. Mm -hmm. We're still going to be trying to create experiences that are with the aim of being healing. And I think whenever you're working in that space, there's a there's a need for reflection, there's a need for support, there's a need to create some kind of space to process that um, and to know how to do that properly. And that need will always be there, whether we're in mm -hmm. crisis as an industry or not. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I really think it's about um, asking yourself or rather knowing your topic really well. So for example, a film that's about a really traumatic topic, that may need more mental health well-being support financially than a film that is about a more, if you will, gentle topic. So it's really knowing knowing your film, knowing, knowing what your own personal resources are to, to support yourself and your crew and your participants. And that really starts, as Rebecca said, um, in, in the pre-production phase, when you're doing some reflection about, about yourself and your project and what the what the needs could be i also want to say and i'll put it in the chat the uk film and tv charity has a wonderful toolkit an online toolkit for filmmakers both narrative and doc that walk you through how to take care of yourself and your crew in the pre-production production and post-production phases and they have incredible resources um, available that you can they, that you can use so i'll put the link in the chat it's really quite incredible and useful very very concrete so while Malika is doing that, we're going to be wrapping up. I want to thank everyone who joined us today, who's been here through the entire thing. I want to give a big shout out to our interpreters um, who have made this as accessible as we can make it. Um, and to all of you, this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end. Um, we will be sending um, the report, the slides, the chat, the video to everybody who signed up for this. The t-shirt, the hat. The yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we didn't spend money on t-shirts, Pat. <laughs> we assure you. Right. Um, but we will share that all with you uh, before the weekend is out. And um, thank you so much for being with us today. And um, stay tuned for more from Documentality. Thanks, everybody. Have, Have good weekends. Take some time for you. Bye. Yes. We appreciate your support, <laughs> y'all. Thanks for coming. You are so welcome, everybody. So many thank yous. Lovely.